A very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. May we request all of you to please take your seats. We're about to begin with the session. Thank you very much, everybody, for being here. And with that, a very good morning once again. I am Kanchi Shah, your host for the day, and it gives me immense pleasure in welcoming all of you to the fifth edition of IBEX India, India's comprehensive event for banking technology, equipment, and services. Welcome, everybody. In addition to the exhibition, IBEX India conferences conceived in 2011 has been a niche platform for all the stakeholders of the BSFI industry to come together, explore, understand, and deliberate on the challenges and opportunities in adopting innovative and disruptive technologies. This year's conference is themed around the future of banking in the digital era. And without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to open with our plenary session. I have the honor and privilege of inviting our dignitaries on stage for the day. I request all of you to please join me with a round of applause as I welcome on stage Mrs. Trishna Guha, the Executive Director, Dana Bank, and Chairperson, Advisory Committee, IBEX India 2017. Thank you very much for being with us. We're also joined by Mr. Eric Enklasaria, Partner, Management Consulting, KPMG. Let's put our hands together and welcome him. Thank you very much for joining us. Let's also put our hands together and welcome Mr. Arundam Mukherjee, Operations Director, Sales, Cisco India and SARC. And let's put our hands together in a loud round of applause as we welcome our Chief Guest for the day, Mr. Mrityunjay Mahapatra, the Deputy Managing Director and Chief Information Officer, State Bank of India. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to open up, and I'm going to request Mrs. Trishna Guha to please join us at the podium and deliver the welcome address and the opening remarks. Let's welcome her to the podium with a round of applause. Uh, respected chief guest for today, Shri Mittunjay Mohapatra, Deputy Managing Director and Chief Information Officer, SBI, Mr. Arinda Mukherjee, Director, Cisco, Mr. Eric Ankalsaria, Partner, Managing Consulting, KPMG, participants from the fintech industry, colleagues from the banking fraternity, friends from the media, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to all of you, and a very grand welcome to this inaugural session of the fifth edition of IBEX 17. I would like to express my deep appreciation to all the dignitaries present on the dais for their support, encouragement, and participation in the IBEX 17. I would like to specially express my sincere gratitude to Mr. Mahapatro for having agreed to be the chief guest of this inaugural program of IBEX 17. His presence indeed elevates the importance of this event and boosts the morale of every participant. IBEX has gradually evolved as a platform for the banking industry to collaborate with the technology partners, fintech companies and startups from across the country as well as the globe. It has simplified the search process for banks in their endeavor to achieve their digital banking goalposts. With more than 150 international exhibitors, IBEX today has received enthusiastic response from all the stakeholders of the banking industry. In the recent times, I think two Ds have become very, very relevant to in our lives. While the former refers to demonetization, a Herculean task executed successfully by banks, the later refers to digitization, which is the very reason which, why all of us are here today. The timing of IBEX and the theme of the conference, Future of Banking in the Digital Era, is rightly poised in such a scenario when the disruption in banking is at large and the banking ecosystem is at the edge of another revolutionary curve. The recent government and RBI directives and the mission to make India a less cash and technology-driven economy complements the efforts of banks to promote digital innovations under the payment systems. The vision is to transform India into a digitally empowered society and knowledge economy. Faceless, paperless, cashless is one of the professed role of digital India. Sincere efforts are being made by banks to introduce innovative and new payment solutions to customers 
and in maximizing enrollments under existing and new alternate channels. With the growing expectations of the customer and the convenience rendered by technologic banks during the recent years have started embracing digitization in their process, delivery channels, customer solutions, customer engagement, and data management systems. The implementation of demonetization followed by accelerated digitization has unleashed vast scope and potential and at the same time has brought in new and historical challenges to the banking industry and its stakeholders. We still need uh, to go a long way in terms of providing seamless transactions. Transaction volumes have surged manifold and capacity building and routing of day-to-day -day transactions has become a bigger challenge for banks. It is the right time when pooling of experience and expertise, as in this forum, is very much critical. The need of the R is to transform and bring in sustainable business models for the benefit of all, which aligns well with the objectives of IBEX. IBEX 17 is showcasing the conference, trade fair, and the awards program Technovity on 20th January, and the Finovity on 21st January, which will bring a complete blend of information on the recent developments in banking payments and the technology ecosystem. The exhibitors will be displaying a wide range of products, services, and banking solutions from micro ATMs, kiosk, cloud computing, blockchain technology, to electronic and physical security solutions, big data management and business analytics, banking equipment, and much more. IBEX India 2017 is also featuring a startup corner, which is offering the Indian BFSI community the opportunity to showcase promising innovations. I wish you all a great experience at IBEX 2017 and urge all participants to make use of this opportunity to meet, interact, and explore various technology-enabled solutions and services. Thank you once again for being with us here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Guha, for setting the ball rolling for the day. And with that, I'm now going to request Mr. Eric Anglisaria to please join us at the podium. He's the partner, management consulting at KPMG, and he's going to take us through a presentation on the theme of the conference, the future of banking in the digital era. Let's put our hands together and welcome Mr. Eric Anglisaria. A very good morning to all of you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, um, and thank you, uh, IBEX, for having us here as the knowledge partner and also um, having us here to present uh, some of our thoughts on the future of banking. I think uh, over the past era, a lot has been talked about banking, digital, uh, blockchain, uh, robotics, uh, artificial intelligence. And each, each organization or each individual that I have met, at least in my career, interprets digital in a very different manner. So forgive me if I am not able to really give a perfect definition to digital because by now I've heard so many definitions and have my own, so it's really difficult to assemble all of that. But I think, I think the presentation that I'm going to really take you through is going to touch upon uh, three aspects of it. One is uh, in the digital economy, where are we? Uh, and what is global really happening? What's really happening in the global arena as far as that's concerned? Uh, what do we need to do to become digitally enabled or ready? Um, and how do we go there? So it's a very, very short presentation, uh, just talking about the theme. And post that, we will be releasing the thought leadership, which we have, uh, which each one of you all can go through, have a read at it. I think there are QR codes, TV setup, where you can just download it onto your mobile phones, etc. So I think starting off with a small um, quote on, uh, on, on, uh, on something that's really important when we talk about future, I think uh, Mr. Thomas Edison has put it very well, that having a vision for what you want is not enough. Uh, a vision without execution is hallucination. So I think, I think a lot has been talked about digital. Various people are gearing towards uh, making their organizations digitally enabled. But a lot of times what we are thinking is that there is a lot of gap between what has been thought as a part of strategy and what's really being implemented on the ground. So this is a really very good uh, quote to really start off with uh, the presentation. Um, I think the broad agenda that I'm going to cover in the next uh, 15 minutes is, uh, you know, why banks and where they're digitally going, uh, where are Indian banks in this journey, and what does one need to have to be a winner in this space? 
So these are the three broad things that I'm going to cover as a short presentation in the next 15 minutes. I think some very good uh, important statistics uh, before we start off the presentation on the global footprint and the Indian footprint as far as digital is concerned. Uh, between 2000 and 2015, uh, the inter internet penetration has grown about sevenfold, from 6.5% to nearly 43%. And for India, the important thing is that it was less than 1% and grown to about 30%. The cashless payments in the world stood at around $387 billion uh, in 2015. The average spending by BFSI players globally on digital initiatives stood at around $142 million globally. Growth of mobile banking in India and China has seen an unprecedented growth, which is around 73% in China, 59% uh, actually happening in India which actually beats Europe and US in, in very, very large numbers, the kind of growth penetrations. The digital wallet market, and I think uh, post-November uh, November 8th, I think these figures would have changed also, uh, has really gone up by a CAGR of more than 30%. Right now, what we estimate is when we did, the, we the, did a small presentation to make Maharashtra cashless economy, uh, between November and uh, December, the figures were, were more than 128% of what had happened over the years, over the period of time, uh, from if you take it from 1st of April till November out there. So, so that's, that's been the kind of uh, trend that has been seen from November to December. And I hope this trend really continues uh, with all the public sector banks and a lot of other banks putting in a lot of, a lot of effort to make every possible thing digitally enabled. I think, I think these figures will go... Uh, north of 300% uh, out there. Uh, as per NASCOM, uh, so we did a small report for NASCOM on fintech uh, recently. And as per NASCOM, the India fintech software market is forecasted to touch US dollars 2.4 billion by 2020, which is currently 1.2 billion. So we're going to see another 400% kind of a hike uh, coming in out there. Uh, I don't know how, how many of you all know that uh, India is the second largest uh, country in the world which has the largest fintech initiatives going on. So as far as the fintech hubs are concerned, India would be amongst the top two or three countries which actually gives rise to a lot of fintech innovations uh, happening out here. I think the question coming to why banks need to really embrace uh, digital and what's, what's really there for them. I think the most important thing that has changed over the period of time is, and, and that's what's really transpired even in surveys that have been conducted, is the actual buying patterns of the consumers. I think erstwhile, uh, you know, there used to be a lot of loyalty towards banks. You know, a particular person has been banking for a long time and he continues banking for that with that bank over a period of 10 years, 20 years. So that was the legacy, that was the theme that was, that was really there. So there was, there was a lot of uh, trust factor. There was, there was a lot of things where people did not easily change from one organization to another. Uh, I think over the last five, seven years, it's really become, banking has become a method of convenience. Uh, if things are faster, smoother, less hassles for me, I don't mind shifting from one bank to another, or I would not mind taking one service from another bank and another service from another bank. So, it's really become that way. Uh, you know, my mother was a, was a stout banker. She retired from Central Bank of India. And I know from the time that she started working till the time that she retired, she had every facility from Central Bank of India. But for me, you know, I might have an account in Central Bank. I might have one account in Kotak. I might one have account in ICICI. So there is no loyalty. The loyalty factor which was there earlier amongst the people that we have seen is really diminishing. The second most important thing that is contributing to this is the is the kind of the triangle that's coming in terms of the population. We have a larger number of population that's really coming between the age of 28 to 35 and 43, and lower ones coming at the higher end. So that's really changing, so people are looking at convenience. People are looking at how easy it is, how fast it is, how convenient it is. Do I nearly need to go to a bank to do banking work? So I think the preference about how banks are targeting consumers and how consumers are buying from banks, that's really driving one of the key agendas for digital banking and future of banking uh, as we speak today. Uh, so I think this is, this is the key important message that I wanted to leave on this slide. Uh, we can't talk less about technology. This being a technology event, uh, this being a technology forum, I think three important uh, 
things that's really, really driving uh, digital, driving, you know, future of banking, that's going to be one, everything to do with the consumer. What is his experience being? How convenient it is? What is the time that I'm taking to service it? I feel very soon we are going to move away from the regime of these fixed-based charges to really service-based charges. I think it's not too far away that we are actually seeing service-based charges coming into the industry. That if I'm able to serve you in so much time, I'll charge you X. If I delay the service, I'll charge you lesser. If I do it more delayed, I might even give you free of cost. So I think, I think it's going to move away. The regime is really going to move into services. And that's why organizations need to gear themselves towards those service deliveries. I think the other most important thing is personalization. You know, every customer, big or small, whether he now has a 5,000 rupee account with you or a 5 lakh rupee account with you, expects much more uh, from any banker. You know, there are a lot of bankers sitting in the room. But now the expectation of the consumer from, from the banking industry or from their bankers uh, has, has dramatically improved, uh, has dramatically risen over a period of time. Earlier, the expectation was not that much. You know, people were happy going to a branch. If you were to tell them that, you know, you need some five signatures to be done on a form, they were patient. I think, I think that patience has been lost over a period of time. Uh, people want quick things. People want easy things. People don't want to kind of stand in long queues, don't want. Everything needs to be personalized, uh, you know, so that's, that's really costing them a lot. The other most important thing is the vendors. Earlier, we used the term vendors. Now we use the term partners. I think, I think that itself shows the dramatic shift that has happened, that how we are treating our ecosystem to be able to deliver things. And I think the last but not the least is the business. Most important is cost versus the benefit that I am really getting. Am I having enough touch points? Because there were a lot of theories floating in the market uh, earlier saying that, you know, customers require a personal touch if we open... If we do everything on digital channels, will we lose the touch with the customers, etc.? So I think there is always that strive. What is the right balance between putting a lot of technology initiatives vis-a-vis -vis personalization and personal touch? So I think, I think the most important thing out of all of that for business is really establishing a viable business model to be able to do whatever we want to do as part of future banking in terms. I think the key focuses that are really, really, really driving the industry. The first and foremost is the real advent of social banking or social media. I think the impact of social media on our lives has now become more important than newspapers, etc., and everything. Um, I don't know how many of you all know that, but the ex-chief minister of Gujarat really resigned over Facebook or Twitter and then put in a formal resignation. So I think that's the importance of social media now to our lives. Um, it's also become important for banks to curtail this uh, uh, this uh, large animal for the reason being that any wrong information or any unhappy information or any unhappy customer uh, can today spread this message to thousands and lakhs of people within matters of minutes or seconds. So it's become very, very important for banks to recognize that this has now become an important part of one's life. And also how social media information can be used by organizations, banks, etc., to their advantage. For example, there have been a lot of banks who have been doing a lot of recovery through using social media. You know, using Facebook, using various other means to do recovery of education loans, to do recovery of large things uh, out there. So they've used social media from both ways. One is to propagate banks' products. The other is to make sure that, you know, uh, they are able to do their work as part of uh, whatever is required from a social media perspective. I think the next most important thing is building the right digital ecosystem. You know, today people are confused. We have so many things. We have tabs, we have mobiles, we have things. Many times what we see is that on different medias or different things, the look and feel of various different applications is completely different. As a result of which, a consumer sometimes gets confused uh, about a lot of things. And then to come up with the task of remembering so many passwords, so many usernames, etc. So, you know, the right kind of balance and mix between the digital presence and digital media is really very, very important right now to the success of digital banking. The other most important thing which is really catching up is the concept of the virtual customer. So banks having realized that the pool of staff which they have is limited, the customers which they need to service is many, 
So how do I get the right expertise at every touch point? Because it's very evident right now. You walk into a bank branch, you're not able to get information about a particular product, you go to the next bank branch. It's as good as that. So you, you can either retain a customer in that five minutes time or you can lose the customer in five minutes time. So it's really become that way. So how do you use virtual presence? And I think, you know, Cisco Arindam, when he talks about that, he can give very good examples of what they have done in the space to have this uh, virtual setup done practically. And last but not the least, you know, as we open ourselves up to everything, uh, we can't undermine the risk of fraud, security, and all of that. So a lot of technology solutions, innovations, actually happening in this particular space about how we secure ourselves from uh, unwarranted things. And last but not the least, all of this, all of this cannot be achieved without having a real, real good backup of data and analytics. All of this really runs on the engine that's of data and analytics. How do you understand your customer? How do you service him? What do you do about him? Is all backed by that. Uh, and I think, I think when Mr. Mahapatra speaks, you know, uh, he'll have a lot of examples on how they've been able to use that uh, to their advantage. I think from an India perspective, this is the maturity graph. Mobile being the most matured thing, followed by NFC and biometrics right now. Digital wallets, that's all, uh, you know, kind of now this is going to go up and, you know, maybe digital wallets or NFC biometrics might change their positions right now. Uh, social media analytics, cloud, blockchain, wearable, right now on a pretty low uh, maturity model within India. A lot of POC is going on in this space, but really uh, somebody to come up with a real, real good used case is is something that's that's really uh, waiting for the Indian market out here. A lot of banks are doing a lot of stuff on these areas which are down below in uh, purple, but real concrete things yet to be seen and visible in this space right now. I think I'll just skip that. Coming down to, I think, innovations that are really taking place and, and, and we're seeing a lot of people moving into this direction. One is basically cloud. Uh, you know, whether we're talking from a big data perspective, data lake perspective, we're talking about moving non-core applications, I think, I think this is really set inside. Uh, we have large organizations as far as the largest banks, largest private sector banks being one of the forerunners uh, into this space, followed by you know, the large public sector banks in India actually looking at cloud and cloud strategies in a very, very different manner uh, right now. I think what's really also catching up, and there are a lot of work that's going around, is on the robo-advisory and artificial intelligence space. A lot of the routine work, people have started with call centers, people have started with wealth advisory. A lot of these things are actually being done on robo-advisory. So HSBC, etc., has rolled out their first, now not the pilot, but actual implementation of robo-advisory and artificial intelligence uh, have been rolled out in certain areas like the contact center, certain areas like wealth management, and investment advisory. So they have actually rolled that out. Uh, there is a huge, huge, huge uh, rollout that is expected to happen in the next year where audit and internal audit will be driven by artificial intelligence. So all the routine work in audit, internal audit, etc., is going to be driven by artificial intelligence out there. A lot of banks have actually started implementing this robo-advisory or bots for the help desk. So all the routine L1 queries which are there from the help desk side are now being put onto robo-advisories uh, out there. We have a lot of banks who we have seen RFPs actually talking about uh, robo-advisory for the L1 support. So I think, I think it's going to change the face of the IT industry also, and it's going to become less and less manpower intensive. Uh, so today, all the IT companies who used to thrive on a lot of business by having a lot of bodies with them, these things are going to change the way that they're going to really be uh, looking at in the future. I think the other thing which is just waiting for regulations to really come out is really P2P lending, crowdsourcing, etc. really, really becoming important. Uh, a lot of fundraising right now happening through this media as far as uh, ventures are concerned. Blockchain, again, a lot of POC is going around, but really a use case to be established or real implementation is yet being awaited. Social media service and analytics, I think, has caught on very, very well. Uh, I think uh, certain banks like Kotak, certain banks like uh, ICICI, HDFC use this to their extreme, extreme advantage. And they actually have a team to do response also. It's not only important that, you know, 
you monitor these activities and, and, and you post a lot of things, but how do you really have a team in place who can respond to something that's really unwarranted for is very, very important in the space. And last but not the least, we've seen a lot of use cases of variables coming around in the insurance space, especially in the general insurance uh, where it is to do with health, motor, and all of that. But really, a lot of use cases not so much coming right now into the banking space. Maybe very small in the private banking space, but not really in the mass and retail uh, segment out there. I think some important challenges with which, which industry is really grappling so. Uh, one is people. You know, we have all of them are erstwhile bankers. Things have changed drastically over the last 10 years, so upgrading their skills, being able to recruit people at that space, being able to find people within India who have this experience. Because, you know, it's very difficult. Foreign markets, European markets, Western markets have had a little bit of edge over this thing. So actually getting the right talent within the country is also very, very uh, critical and important. I think processes, there is a lot of asymmetry between what you think on a digital platform and how your processes are there. So it takes a lot of convincing through risk management and all of that to actually get processes aligned to what you're thinking is really to become a digital bank. Because there you're talking about convenience, speed, etc., and the other side you're talking about risk controls. So many a times there is a very, very, very challenging balance between both of that. And last but not the least, technology. A lot of banks put in a lot of systems erstwhile. Uh, and from that, the pressures of business, etc., have been always driving these things. So there is a lot of outdated technology. There is a lot of technology which needs to be refreshed just to be able to ride on these channels and a lot of integration touch points which are huge in terms of cost. So I think, I think from a winner strategy, very simple. Uh, most organizations or many organizations also feel that if somebody is doing something, it's easy for us to replicate and start doing that. I think that's the most wrong approach that one would really take as far as a digital strategy is concerned. I think it's to start with just looking at smaller pieces about digital enablement what you can start off as a small thing by just enabling process to become digital. Then moving on to something, how you're going to differentiate yourself. That really talks about the digital differentiator. And then actually comes the actual strategy of redefining your complete goals and complete strategy, how you make your organization you know, stand on its head. So I think, I think people have to start with the smaller things, go to differentiating themselves, and not try and replicate what somebody else is doing because the environment in which that other person is doing that may be completely different from what you have within your organization. And then actually stepping on and redefining a complete digital strategy for an organization. So that would be our thought process of that. And I think the key priorities are definitely in terms of assessing capabilities in the space, identifying what are the quick wins and enablers, because any project which is beyond six months and does not show results start losing its focus within the organization also. Designing a digital plan which is actually supported and backed by the topmost level within the organization. And then last but not the least, uh, for a lot of organizations, is actually bringing in that change management, institutionalizing change management within that thing. So I think um, last but not the least, three important things I would like to leave you with. Nothing beyond these three critical success factors. Innovation is the game changer for anybody. Because I think with the advent of all these small banks, payment banks, and all of that, everybody is looking at how they're going to be differentiating from the other. So you cannot stop innovating and thinking. The second most important thing is agility. How fast can you act? One, it is to put it down on paper. The second is to take it to market. And the third portion is relentless implementation. So these are the three most critical aspects about you know, when you're talking about future of banking, when you're talking about things, is how fast you're able to innovate, move, and implement. So I think, ladies and gentlemen, this is that all that I had from my end as a part of the 15-minute presentation. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, we need to just launch the... Yeah? Or do you want to do it at the end? Once we finish. Yeah, so we can do it at the end. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for a patient hearing. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Anklesaria. And with that, we're now going to move forward into our next presentation, which is on reimagining the digital economy. And this by Mr. Aradham Mukherjee, who's the operations director for sales 
at Cisco India and SARC. Let's all put our hands together and welcome on to the podium, Mr. Arunam Mukherjee. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome again to IBEX conference. Uh, it really means a lot <clears throat> for so many people in this room to be collectively present to imagine a future. And I'm really excited to the, to, to, to the thoughts of the organizers that you first have someone who's a researcher, and then you get someone like a preacher, and then someone like Mr. Mahapatra as a practitioner to come and talk about this digital disruption coming and hitting. It's a wonderful way that you can really start making the sense of the flow in which they try to build uh, the picture around this whole thing. The way I look at this digital disruptions to come in, I think as producers of product and services, today we are selling more and more technology while we are selling our product and services. It's very profound. And as a consumer, while we are consuming there, we are actually sending a lot more data about the way we are consuming it. So if you really look at it that the way ideally uh, that is the point I'm trying to make it here, that the way traditionally the products and services used to be produced in a normal economy, and there is a, there is a book by Sangeet Paul Chaudhary on this, The Platform Economy, is that the values used to be created at two extremes of the, of the pipe. What basically means is that I create the product in typical banking terms, the assets and liability products, and, and I actually go and sell on the other extreme of the pipes. And actually, as a consumer, I have those many number of choices and preferences, and there is by and large a commoditization of that. I'll pause your mind to basically look at all of, all of you would be using the taxi hailing services. When you actually get down from any of the Ubers and Ola, you actually rate the driver. The driver also gets to rate you. While you get to book a particular taxi services, you get a heat map and you say that your charge is going to be 4x and 3x. A, a driver who is standing at Goregao is actually going to get a notification that the heat map is around Bandra Kula complex and you move there. What basically means is that the producers and the sellers are hooking up to a platform to create a value for each other. And if I really need to take you back to the innovation that we are seeing First, it is being laid by the government in terms of Aadhaar and the EKYC. Today, it is possible. I think it's almost 1.01 billion Aadhaar accounts, Aadhaar, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, certification which has happened. Coupled with that, EKYC is first inferences of a platform which is ready to identify an individual in this country. That's the first part of this platformization which has happened. If that is government-led, let me come to the next one, which is the regulator-led, which is NPCI, which is basically saying that I'm going to be creating a platform where all of the payments are going to be colliding. Okay, Unified payment interface, all of you would have heard about, is one such inference that mobile-to-mobile -mobile money transfer is going to be possible through email as perhaps only once means one means for you to go to get identified. The third piece of the innovation which is happening is across multiple small entrepreneurs coming in. Just think about it, that if I'm an Uber driver, I'm actually an entrepreneur who's connected to this platform economy. At the same time, I'm sharing that economy, right? So this platform effect is basically creating a tremendous amount of opportunities and scope for the financial services to be included. The second piece of this disruption is coming towards the model acceleration. And, and I take back the examples of 2000.com burst. I don't know how many of you in this room really recall that. Cisco's market capitalization came crashing by one-eighth in a span of 72 days. All right? What had happened in that point of time, it was 2000-2001. In the middle of the disruption, what profound thing which has happened is that the whole world has laid fiber optic cable under the seabed, all right? The first round of internet evolution which has happened and all of these companies, dot-com companies which you have seen, they had an astronomical valuation. But in the market, there was no access mechanism. There is no payment mechanism and most of it, there was no connectivity for people to use goods and services on the internet. So when those things started getting exposed, the valuations came down and the economy started going for a tailspin. But what had happened? The fiber optic cable remained under the seabed. All right? 
And when the next phase of evolution came and you could see all of these things coming in, the access, payment, etc., what is the magical impact that you that would have seen? If I take you back to the demonetization today, my guess is that the number of pause terminals in the last three and a half months coupled with another three months would be four times compared to what it used to be. The number of micro ATMs, what it used to be is supposed to be 10 million by end of to, uh, March of this year. The point I'm making is that the demonetization is perhaps one of the profound impact of that classical dot-com burst that we have seen when everything seems to be disrupted. And when the calm has settled down, you see a new kind of infrastructure to start growing the new advent of the digital economy. I can tell you that one particular bank is about to roll a service without naming him, where along with the uh, you know, home loan solution, he is going to be rolling up a digital uh, augmented reality solution. What it basically means is that if you're in Bandra or Santa Cruz, you point, and, and you have to download that along with the mobile banking solution, you point your camera, mobile camera, to the particular under construction property, and it is going to say, tell you through big data and algorithm and machine learning uh, what is the possible per square foot rate of that particular property. And you can query that. You can say that this is not affordable, I want following, and it will show you that north of west of 20 miles, you can go in Sakinaga to find that property. Value proposition is going through a seed change in this whole piece. Another example I would like to give you uh, is about a conversational-led UI, okay? So all of you are aware about the innovations which are coming from traditional disruptors like Google or Microsoft. This bank is saying that I will transform my entire banking services with a conversational UI. What it basically means today, you might be you know, using a WhatsApp or WeChat or Snapchat or whatever it is. And today, for example, you are going to go and book a uh, movie ticket. What you go, you generally go to book my show. You basically go there and you get the OTP. You come out of the application and you go and authenticate yourself and then the SMS comes. And then you go to your WhatsApp group and you go and tell your friends that this is the movie I'm going to be going for. Okay? In the conversational UI, what happens is that, and this is like a typical machine learning algorithm. Again, Cisco is doing a lot of work on that. You basically say that, I need to book two tickets for the following show in the following theater. And it basically gets to be delivered as a QR code on your chat window. So what basically means that in one single chat window, it basically transforms your experience about the way you are going to do banking. Now, this is very profound because this doesn't happen by itself. The point that Eric was perhaps making that there is a tremendous amount of data analytics which has to happen because the next recommendation you are going to get is not on your email or not a call center agent calling but through a chat window, which is going to go through your social profile, your location data, last places you visited. And to, to an extent, that banker tells me that I would be able to predict your behavior way better than you can think about yourself. I believe that this disruption is happening across on the strength of rapid scale availability of the data. And one first example of it coming through the Reserve Bank of India publishing, uh, I think in the month of October or November, the publishing of the data access and, 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 and the access guide. What it basically means today, for example, if you go and try to, as a producer of the content, you really do not have any uniform way to publish and access data, be the Facebook, LinkedIn, etc. So finally, RBI has came out with a guideline of publishing the data publishing data standards by all of these people. And if I'm a consumer of the data, means I'm a small business who, who's building these services on the strength of, uh, you know, rapid, rapid scale data analytics. You know, there are companies like Fairsense, et cetera, I'm sure you guys would be aware about, uh, massively disrupting the P2P lending space, SME lending space. They're fundamental, and I invest in few companies. I can tell you their primary principle of doing the business is to do data analytics. So one company which lends to SME space, they basically do a ranking. This is the Amazon or Flipkart or Snapdeal ranking that you do when you buy your Samsung or iPhone. So you go and rank that particular guy. They take the ranking profile of that. They go to promoters, uh, you know, net banking profile, promoters, tax details, and do a rapid scale five minutes analytics about the way that a loan should be given to that particular guy for that. It's a working capital loan for 30, 60 days. P2P lending is also getting disrupted. The point I'm making is that the profoundness of the data and your ability to go and make a sense out of it is going through absolutely crazy limits. And the point first I was making is that if you're going to have the regulatory activism supporting around that, just to give you a sense, 
today you may not have any mobile phone you have an aadhar card as a villager you can go in front of a micro atm and start transacting you do not have a feature you do not have a smartphone but you have a feature phone you can start basis the ussrd codes which is controlled by the trai you have a smartphone you can do it through the mobile mobile wallets or through unified payment interface so basically from the government and from the regulator and from the massive scale innovation happening through the wallet providers there is a product and solution available in every single income strata of this of this country to be digitally included and i believe that coupled with the demonetization the points that i was reflecting that this interface of coming into the economy is going to be further more accelerated now the now if you really look at it this this kind of disruption even if i was talking to mr mahapatra or aruna rao in sitting in the audience five years back it was unheard the, the way you built the infrastructure was made for fixed wall economy just to give you a sense about security threats and parity but i'm sure all of you are about about jp morgan uh, 76 million and 8 million 76 million unique cards theft which has happened the fraudster did not actually stole steal any data in that two year two days window in which the two factor authentication window was open okay so the fraud so someone some employee kept the two factor authentication window open for 48 hours the fraudster in a command and control mechanism left their uh, you know tools inside and after 48 hours the window closed and then the ceo gets a call that i have access to your 76 million credit cards and this is my ransomware demand today if you do a google for ransomware you can find some russian company selling it uh, on command and control 24 by 7 support ransomware which you can buy and start launching an attack that's possible today just to give you a sense for example you are roaming somewhere in karnataka or somewhere in in the, in the us and and you are trying to access cnnibn.com it's a news right it goes and hits a server called dns server i'm sure all of you are it savvy right if the dns server is hacked by the fraud star then cnnibn.com is masked to be a alternate ip dns stream which would be hosted somewhere in in kenya or or in russia what happens is that the ip stream goes there and through that particular port it basically permeates through your network and start siphoning it out these possibilities of multiple ways to come for the customers and for your employees within the organization has never been envisaged so security is a key paradigm in which the enterprises need to think that's one part of the rewriting the infrastructure that i feel the second part of is that the mobile economy the way you used to have your mobile drops in different application ecosystem and you used to do as an it administrator used to be 6 months or 9 months has come down to 3 or 4 weeks your ability to query the infrastructure has to be that more nimble that much flexible that's why we as cisco has opened completely the infrastructure all codes are known in the form of api it is for the application programming interface to come and do that the third and profound changes is about the way you look and query the cloud two years back in these conferences there is to be a lot of debate about the how do i contract with a cloud provider okay do i do an individual contract or an enterprise contract what is my exit policy what are the security paradigms around that today's environment basically allows you to query a cloud come out of different clouds on a flicker federate between different clouds you can have today for example an amazon cloud or an azure cloud or a google cloud or a private instances of multiple applications that you are hosting maybe out of netmagic or whatsoever today's technology is allowed today for you to start federating between these different clouds so the point i'm making is that if this digital disruptions has to come and hit you as a preacher i believe that the thinking around the way the possibilities need to be rolled out to the practitioners like state bank etc have to be differently thought when cisco is trying to leave frog in this pursuit to create a flexible and agile infrastructure which cuts across from the way you secure inter- your enterprises the way you roll out your applications to way you acquire your customers i think eric did mention about uh, you know uh, the collaboration piece we worked with state bank of india very closely in terms of uh, remote expert solution uh, which is there on their sby in touch and we are working with them very closely to basically roll that out across 250 more branches in terms of uh, you know further flexibility they have rolled out a uh, wealth advisory services which is on the premises of the mobile advisor which is basically a 
three party high speed video conferencing screen sharing annotation which basically takes completely the need away for someone to be face to face to sell any advisory products in front of it so these disruptions have to be consumed have to be thought through and my request to all of you is that these conferences are really really good platform for someone to pause because we in our in, in our day to day life we hardly get any time to pause and reflect these conferences get the like minded people to come together to pause and reflect and ruminate on the ideas being shared by the people on this panel and as i would last uh, you know close the comment with with this uh, with this gentleman called william gibson he says that the future is already arrived but it's not evenly distributed and i do strongly believe this in this room the ideas has to cross pollinate for the future to be coalesced to form for the tomorrow thank you very much thank you very much mr mukherjee and with that we now move forward to our special address on digital transformation by our chief guest for the day mr mrutunjay mahapatra the deputy managing director and chief information officer state bank of india thank you uh, mrs guha the chairperson of the organizing committee and executive director of the nab bank my friend eric my friend arindam and all of you who are present here this morning uh, on this on this morning to know about this very relevant theme which is that what is the future of banking in the new digital era how uh, how do we define you know uh, a digital era has been dealt well by uh, eric and of course some of the uh, some of the other wisdom has come from all the other speakers and today it is impossible almost to 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 find any conference in which digital is not spoken mobility is not spoken in fact few days back uh, uh, economic times asked me to write an article i i i think some of you might have uh, read it how do we measure the digital preparedness of the banks today so i gave a framework but today uh, i will not speak about that framework i'll speak more about you know what is it that digital transformation is digital transformation to my view is 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 a strategy transformation per se if you go to the dictionary definition of transformation it is that you know you cannot identify the stages of change probably if someone has seen me during my childhood and someone has seen me during my teenage and someone has seen me during my adulthood and now he will see that i have changed but i have not transformed but if you have seen a caterpillar caterpillar and you have seen the butterfly probably that is the transformation so what we are talking here is complete makeover where you cannot probably identify the new entity which has come out of the old by identifying the attributes of the old and by recognizing the attributes of the new so that is transformation and let us talk i'll be very brief i have four five slides and but more i wanted to know that uh, how you yourselves are thinking of transforming your business because if you do not transform yourself the ecosystem will force you to transform as someone told in one of the other meetings that i was attending a few days back digitization is no more a choice either you digitize or you perish so how do you transform digitization or how do you transform your strategy now briefly i'll tell you uh, what is the framework you know those of you who are students of management will know there are two or three frameworks in which we have uh, we define strategy one is michael porter's framework 
Michael Porter says that in any any competitive rivalry, there is a threat of uh, by, there is a threat of new entrants, there is a threat of substitutive entrants, and there is a buyer power and there is a supplier power, which interplays. And if you look at other strategies like Seven S framework of McKinsey, McKinsey says that you know there is there is a set of skills, staff, and uh, uh, there is a strategy, there is a structure, there is a system, and they play to create shared values. So how do we create shared value is probably the essence of the uh, essence of the transformation journey. Now, first thing first, digital is not technology. Forget about it. If you think that digital transformation can be attained by buying a lot of technology and implementing it, by buying those artifacts, by being mobile, by doing it fast, by automating, I think you have not got even the tip of the iceberg. So what is it? In today's world, to be digital, to digitally transform ourselves, it could be different for your business, it could be different from a bank to a, in an insurance company or to a, another BFSI institution, but more or less the headlines are same. The digital transformation will require you to understand, internalize, and analyze the interfaces between your business and your customer. And what exactly is happening today? Today the customer is not a customer, N is not equal to one. Although we have to provide for N as if equal to one. In fact, we were having a board strategy conference a few days back where somebody told customer wants to consume things in a sachet. Minimum amount that is required for a single use, if necessary, that cannot be used, can be thrown away. That is the amount in which technology is to be consumed today. And we must be ready and we must digitally transform ourselves. And today's customer's personality is that of a networked customer's personality. And what is that network? We will try to analyze in a, in a few uh, moments from now. Second is the business value proposition. You know, in, I also wrote in, in both the news, uh, newspaper articles that I wrote in the last fortnight or something that the customer today is looking for the novelty of experience just for the sake of it is it is new it is different it may not be earth shakingly you know uh, value giving but that newness is required if that be so then how do we derive business value business models or the transformation cycles or the change cycles will be so rapid. I remember you know, when I joined State Bank of India, probably uh, it took 20 years for the bank to have the first complete makeover. The next one took probably five years. Now we are seeing a change coming in one year. And we must be prepared and we are preparing ourselves as State Bank of India that next change probably will come in three months. So this rapid value transformation, there is no, uh, no uh, venue again, no discussion, no debate where we do not discuss monetization, demonetization or monetization. Now look at the business model. Merchant acquiring business. Giving good money, giving good connect, suddenly everything is made free. You can't charge for the post machine, you can't charge MDR, so where is the business value proposition? You'll have to reorient, rediscover yourself. In fact, a few days back, we, we were attending another brainstorming meeting with uh, Nandan Nilkeni. He told something which is very, very instructive. That interest income and fee income as the, as the drivers of the balance sheet or profitability of banks will go away in two or three years. So the business value proposition has to be rediscovered in digital transformation journey and digital transformation preparedness will require all of us to get those tools, to get those technology, to reorient and implement 
at extraordinary speed the business value propositions that are coming differently every moment of our life. Innovation will drive it. And of course, I think Arindam told about platforms. Another thing is about data. Data will be the new oil. Data will be the new money. But data will be the crude oil. Many of you who would have attended my previous thing, previous lectures, would have heard that data is the oil, but data is the crude oil. It requires you know, a lot of refining to be usable. Now, this is the beauty. You know, all these things, innovation, platform, customer orientation, business value, all these headlines are okay. But digital transformation will have to happen in a way where everything is going in every direction possible. It is like a Brownian motion. Those of you who are students of physics will understand. You know, every, every ion is moving in every direction possible and colliding and emitting energy. And a new ion is getting created. So what, what, what I told right at the beginning is that customers are not behaving probably the way they were behaving five years back. Customers, few years back, I think four or five years back, Harvard Business Review wrote an excellent article about the virtual personalities. Many of us wear five or seven kind of hats. We are a different person when we are in private. We are a different person when we are in family. We are a different person when we are in Facebook. We are a different person when we are in Twitter. And digital transformation has to capture these unique personalities when people are in different platforms. And buying behavior will be triggered in each of these platforms. When you are visiting a shop with family, when you are doing standalone shopping on the Facebook, when you are in a digital marketplace, when you are with your significant other, or when you are in a romantic holiday, all buying behaviors are different. So if the business strategy or the digital strategy is taking one customer as one customer, probably there is an error. So the network customer must be targeted. So that is why I am telling that, that the marketing funnel, as we call it, funnel is collecting the leads and shortlisting the leads, collecting to warm leads, doing the cold calls, doing the warm calls, getting and closing the sales, losing the marketing. That has to be completely redefined. And that has to be tooled. Customer relationship management at the top must cater into all the things that is possible. How do we collect this big data? The customer is behaving in different pa patterns in different platforms. How do we do it? Very, very important. Then, of course, Eric told and also Arindam referred to what we are doing in SBI, for example, in terms of customer journey mapping. Customer goes through a path. Buying a home loan is not just going and paying the money or taking the loan from a bank. Customer is shortlisting houses. Customer is thinking about you know, redesigning the house. Customer is thinking of a Bastu consultant. Everything is customer journey. How do we create those platforms? How do we create those marketplaces? Why do, how do we create those ecosystems? So when you are designing products and services, whether you are in banking sector or in finance sector and in insurance sector, digital transformation will warrant that you must think about the customer journey. And it is impossible to do it all alone. In this world, I cannot deliver the entire value chain to the customer. Some of us in State Bank of India, for example, we tried, at least the, the financial ecosystem. If customer needs finance, he can come to SBI Life. If he, if he needs life insurance, he comes to SBI Life, needs SBI cards for his card requirement, for general insurance. But customer journey today is much beyond, as I told you, the requirements of the financial sector alone. And the digitization transformation has to take all that into account. So a new world, uh, there, is, there is a new book which has come, and I borrowed it from there. It's called Cooperation. It's called Digital Transformation Playbook. 
Forrester, Gartner, everybody has done a lot of research around it. But from my own experience, you know, today uh, when I go to meetings, I am asked that uh, what about the disruptors, you know, what about the PTMs of the world or what about the uh, small banks, IDFC banks of the world. I remember in uh, when 92, when the first wave of uh, reforms came, uh, everybody gave State Bank of India probably three to five years to survive. But again, I take you back to Michael Porter's theory. The existing players have also equal power of resilience. I always call the power of the existing player to disrupt the disruptors. The new disruptors are single trick ponies. They take a single pain point of the customers and work around it to develop a new product. But existing players like me or Trishna, I mean, we have a bundle, a suite of products which we can bundle, blend, and create new offerings. And they cannot match. We have the richness of data. So we must collaborate with them. We must learn with them. Can we provide our platforms? Can we take their platforms? I think uh, Eric and uh, Arindam both told about, you know, it is again very difficult to, uh, you know, uh, miss uh, any conference where uh, Uber is not discussed or Amazon is not discussed. Amazon, a company which doesn't have any merchandise but it is the biggest retailer or uh, they say that Uber doesn't have a single car, biggest car company. Uh, or, or for that matter, Facebook, which doesn't have any content, but biggest content provider. So these are examples of platform, but in India also things are happening. And all platform, whether it is NPCI as a clearinghouse or whether it is uh, Aadhaar as the authenticator, platforms are going to rise. So collaboration will be the key and internalization. I told about data, but one thing is that capturing, you know, uh, digital transformation, uh, two things I will say. One is do not forget about data security and privacy. The short-term goals must not override the long-term interest because regulators are talking. Data security today, you know, there is no, you, you download any free app, he asks you to tick everything. He can use your telephone number, he can use your contact list, he can use your location, he can use your apps. You can do anything with it. But please do not get pandered into that game because regulation will catch up. Second thing is that your ability. When you are doing digital transformation, natural language processing, getting into bigger conversation because as I told customer or anybody who is buying your services, consuming your services, whether he is your own staff or he is somebody else, he will be at many, many points. So as uh, Cisco is doing good work in Internet of Everything, they call it, they do not call it Internet of Things. So you will have to acquire data from these touch points, from unstructured conversations, and get into insights of these. Some cultural changes, because they say culture, if it is not change, changed, it eats strategy for breakfast. First thing it will eat is your strategy. So. One thing is that it must be, it, it, there is no democracy in, uh, you know, digital transformation. It has to be top driven because the pace will be so big, so huge that in a democratic and federated manner, digital transformation cannot be achieved. That is at least my view. There has to be some benevolent dictatorship right from the top and it must be led from the top. Second is that... Uh, how IT matters to the customer. You know, many times in banks, we do a lot of strategy in boardrooms. We reimagine, imagine, and things. But uh, at the end of it, when it goes, it falls flat because customer has not been kept central. How does it matter? In State Bank of India, what we are doing is that we are inviting customers to come and sit in the laboratory during the user application testing. And that is giving us good traction and good results. And that must be the cornerstone of many of your discussions. Then digital touch, touch points they have told and uh, one more thing is that many times the uh, digital thing requires space but at the same time you cannot overlook details 
it is an oxymoron many times they say that if you are very fast you tend to you know skip details you tend to become high level oriented in digital economy it doesn't work digital transformation meaning you must have an eye for the detail you must have the ability to ask reask try retry fail take the uh, vendors and the partners to rigorous questioning because detailed orientation is important last is uh, you know my favorite point which is innovation you have to be innovative you have to open yourself to open resources where support is not available only some community is available ideation must be rapid shortlisting must be rapid i am getting a little skeptical about these hackathons because hackathons creates a lot of positive vibe but positive vibe if it is not sustained when the rubber hits the road there is a problem so these hackathon ideation sessions must be quickly taken to implementation otherwise it doesn't work people will think yeah yeah something is happening yeah it wale kuch kar rahe hain crowdsourcing and open api you must as i told you must work with customers you must work with your own employees so that ideas will come because they are also stakeholders so they will also you know kind of co innovate with you and of course ai and robotics people have told thank you very much i hope i have told you uh, enough about uh, uh, how to digitally transform thank you Thank you very much Mr Mahapatra and with that ladies and gentlemen we're going to move forward and launch the TR that Mr Eric Engelsaria spoke to you about and I'm going to request him to please join us on to the podium and do the same our dignitaries on stage giving you the glimpse of the report can we all join in with a round of applause thank you very much and with that ladies and gentlemen i'm now going to request mr pradeep devia the chairman and ceo of pda trade fest to please join us on stage and hand over mementos to our dignitaries for joining us on the session and their presentations can we welcome him on stage with a round of applause everybody The first one for our chief guest of the day, Mr. Mathunjay Mahapatra. Thank you very much, sir, for being with us this day. I request you to please accept this memento. Mrs. Trishna Guha, thank you very much, ma'am. Mr. Eric Enkisaria, thank you very much for joining us on the session. and we start in the mukarji thank you very much and uh, with that ladies and gentlemen i would request mr uh, srinivas s uh, the managing director of pda trade fest to please join us on stage and deliver the word of thanks may i request you to please welcome him on stage with a round of applause Good afternoon, everybody. I am so happy that I have been tasked with this very pleasant uh, activity to thank all of those who have supported in this journey of Fibex India. We have now completed five editions. I eagerly look forward to this thank you note always, and I am excited to deliver the thank you note. however i am little anxious always when i deliver this because i am a little worried i may inadvertently leave out all those we sincerely wish to thank 
I sincerely pray and hope I don't leave out anybody today. With that, I firstly begin by thanking our guests on the dais, Shri Mrutinjay Mahapatra, TMD and CIO, State Bank of India, Ms. Trishna Gua, ED Dena Bank, and the chairperson of IBEX India 2017 Advisory Committee, Mr. Eric Anklesaria, Partner Management Consulting, KPMG, and the Knowledge Partners of IBEX India Conference, and Mr. Arindam Mukherjee, Director, Banking and Financial Services, Cisco, India and SARC. Thank you all for making the time to grace IBEX India 2017 at this plenary session. From the inception of IBEX in 2011, the banking community has lent its might in helping us steer the event through an advisory committee. This addition to the advisory committee headed by Ms. Trishna Guha, the executive director of Dena Bank, has played a critical role in developing the theme, the topics, and selection of speakers. I would like to express a sincere thanks to the following members of the advisory committee. Firstly, the chairperson, Ms. Trishna Guha, executive director of Dena Bank. Vice chairman, Mr. Patrick Kishore, senior domain expert, Institute for Development and Research in Banking Technology. And the members, Mr. Abhay Johore, Head Digital Consumer Bank, IDFC Bank. Mrs. Aruna Rao, CTO, Kotak Mahindra Bank and Group Companies. Mr. Babu Nair, MD and Publisher, Banking Frontiers. Mr. Burra Bucci Babu, General Manager, IT Bank of India. Mr. Eric Anklesaria, Partner Management Consulting, KPMG. Mr. M.K. Madhavan Kandadai, CTO, Indusind Bank Limited. Mr. Manoj Agarwal, Group Editor, Banking Frontiers. Mr. Nabankur Sen, CISO, Bandhan Bank. Captain Rakesh Patni, AGM Chief Security Officer, Bank of India. Mr. Rajesh Thapar, Senior Vice President and CISO, Yes Bank. Mr. Ram Rastogi, VP and Head, IMPS, National Payments Corporation of India, NPCI. Mr. Ravi Kiran Mankikar, Head Retail Banking, the SVC Cooperative Bank Limited. Of course, a very special thanks to Ms. Trishna Goa for agreeing to be the chair of the committee and for her support in guiding us with the conference theme and topics. I would like to mention here she has been, she has extended unreserved support whenever my team or I have badgered her with requests for help in garnering, garnering the support of all banks for the event. Her enthusiasm inspired and energized us to go the extra mile in connecting with all banks. Thank you indeed, Madam Guaji. IBEX India could not have sustained the endeavor of bridging banks with technology for five editions now without the support of most of the important banks, which are the most important part of the BFSI ecosystem. Many banks have supported since the first edition. My sincere thanks to all those banks who have extended support for the 2017 edition. Thanks to Allahabad Bank, Bank of India, Bank of Maharashtra, Central Bank of India, Dena Bank, Federal Bank, Indian Bank, Karnataka Bank Limited, Karur Vaishya Bank, Kotak Mahindra Bank, Oriental Bank of Commerce, SVC Cooperative Bank Limited, Syndicate Bank, Yes Bank, Yuko Bank for supporting and endorsing IBEX India 2017. Support from industry aligned associations is a key component in defining the credibility and success of any event. IBEX India has had the fortune of attracting support from industry friendly professional associations such as ATMIA. Cloud Computing Innovation Council of India, Cyber Society of India, the Maharashtra State Cooperative Banks Association Limited, the National Federation of State Cooperative Banks Limited, the Rajasthan Urban Cooperative Banks Federation Limited. A trade event needs equal and enthusiastic participation from the demand side as well as the supply side to make the event truly memorable and successful. IBEX India since 2011 and grow, has grown in size edition on edition, thanks to the trust and confidence of our exhibitors who have placed in the event to meet their objectives. A big thanks to all our exhibitors who have continued to support us since 2011. The big ticket expenses in any, any event are made possible by those magnanimous souls we prefer to call patrons. With great pleasure, I take this opportunity to thank Cash Processing Solutions, Current Tech Software and Consultancy Private Limited, Finesse IT Labs, Ganibo India, Image Info Systems, Kulede Technopack, Methodex Systems, Miles Software Solutions, MRL Postnet, Oxygen Services India, 
Tata Communications Payment Solutions Limited, Zone Startups India and Quisk who have helped us fund many of the facilities here. As a trade fair organizer, we unashamedly admit to having limited domain knowledge and depend on partners who can bring the domain knowledge expertise to deliver a successful event. I thank KPMG for stepping in this year and filling in the knowledge gap. A special thanks to Mr. Eric and his team for helping us capture the suggestions of the advisory committee in its entirety and transforming the same into topics worthy of deliberation at the conference. As all of you would perhaps agree, media, especially industry-specific media, plays a big role in disseminating relevant news on emerging technology trends amongst other industry-specific news, views, and analysis. Banking Frontiers has been doing this and much more for many years now. Ever since we launched IBEX India way back in 11, Banking Frontiers have been supportive of our initiative and have helped us achieve the event's objective of bridging banks with technology by throwing their entire might behind the event as our conference co-organizer. IBEX wishes to unreservedly thank Babu Nair, Manoj and their entire team for their immense support to the event. Last but not least, I and my team wish to thank all our vendors and service providers who have shown great spirit to put this event together. Thank you everyone once again. Before I sign off, I request you all to make time to spend time visiting the expo during the breaks. We have over 150 exhibitors. This is the largest show over the four editions. And also remember the event is open for three days. Day two and day three will feature award ceremonies, technovity and finovity being organized by Banking Frontiers. Thank you once again and have a great time at IVX India 2017. Thank you.